Hello, today is March 4th, 2008, and we are in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus. And today we welcome back William F. O'Brien. Welcome, Bill. I'm glad to be here. This is part two of an interview with Bill O'Brien. Part one included his service in the Army Air Force. He was a second lieutenant, and he was a crew member, part of a crew of approximately 10 people who um, were shot down. Shot down, I'm sorry. And in fact, just to reiterate what you said in part one, uh, you were on an assignment learning some new technical information as a navigator. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, I, I actually was shot down with a crew that I was not familiar with mm -hmm. because my crew had gone from Tunis in North Africa to Italy and I was just coming back from a one week of schooling, schooling when a bombardier became sick that was scheduled to go on a mission on December 8, 1943, and I was told to fill in for him on that mission. We were shot down from ground to air missiles or flak as we called it in those days. So you were on a plane that you didn't know, and you were with a crew that you didn't know. Right. And you were shot down. So this particular interview today is going to concentrate on your being shot down and being a prisoner of war for approximately 16 months. 16, well, OK. I think you were shot down, you said, and then for a number of weeks you were brought by train to different areas. Do you want to talk about that? Well, uh, I was, I was f from Athens where I was shot down. Well, I was flown to Salonika, and on Salonika I was boarding a train that was poor, more or less the tail end of a freight train, and it was just a kind of a rough and ready uh, passenger train, but nothing elaborate. And I was guarded by uh, a couple of soldiers, and I think there were three of us that were part of uh, that contingent at that time. Do but you they were not members of my crew, the other people. And the members that were also shot down. Some did survive and some did not? We lost four people on that, four uh, soldiers on that particular mission. And unfortunately, I couldn't even call their parents when I got home because I didn't know them. So you were guarded by German soldiers? Just your two German soldiers that were actually going home on leave for the Christmas holidays. Do you remember, were you injured at all? Uh, I was, at the time, I, uh, the parachute uh, made me, the going back and forth made me air sick, and I regurgitated or vomited, I guess. Uh, and uh, when I landed on the ground, I was more or less unconscious, and I, uh, hurt my back and I was taken by the Germans to a Greek, to the hospital in Greece, in Athens. And how did they treat you there? Oh, wonderful. And was, the, was it a, a Greek hospital with Greek yes, medical care? Greek hospital, Greek medical care. When I say wonderful, they, they couldn't speak my language and I couldn't speak theirs, but we smiled. And how long were you at the hospital? Just about two days. And then you were put on a train. Then I went back and was, yes, I was, I was transferred to a train, and uh, which uh, went through the, probably the, along the Baltic Sea by going into Albania and 
uh, Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia and I think Hungary. How long were you on the train for? Well, it was uh, December, I would think counting probably about the middle of December and I ended up in Vienna on Christmas Eve, not, not Christmas Eve, but uh, Christmas Day. And how long did you stay in Vienna? Oh, Vienna was just a question of being herded to another uh, train. And if I remember from part one, this wasn't as nice a train? Oh no, this is a typical boxcar. And, uh, like a they, cattle car a we cattle might car refer to? with just straw in it. And uh, it was, it did not have any kind of amenities. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, there was no facilities there. It was just unfortunately that could happen. How many were in the car with you? Do oh, you remember? I would think there was 20, 25 guys. And what was your sense? Were you emotional? Were you calm? Were you nervous? The rest of you, did you talk? What was it well, like? I Do you think remember? I cry every day the way it is. And uh, no particular... The feelings, of course, you were afraid or scared, but not, you know, there was... At one time, it was very scary because I, if we wanted to get into that, while on this train, we were, one evening, we were put on a siding and the RAF was bombing a, uh, the railroad yard that was attached to where we were and the bombs were going off around us and um, the flak guns that were just outside our plane, our train, uh, was just like in the middle of a, what you'd see in a, a you know, in a, say in a movie when they were trying to show that kind of action. And it did, was just explosions after explosions. And did any of the um, guards tell you what was happening or where you no, were going? No. Did any of them speak English? Uh, I am not sure of that. Mm -hmm. And how long were you on the boxcar? Oh, I would think from Vienna up to Frankfurt. And they certainly didn't have the we were put on sidings every so often so troop trains could get by or some other types of trains that had a higher priority. And uh, in time, I think probably just after the New Year's in 1944, sometime in early January. And you were saying it had no amenities and it had straw. Now this is in winter. So you were on a train and this boxcar was not heated? Not, no, not heated. And did they feed you? <clears throat> at, the, at one point, probably around before you get to, before I arrived in Vienna, they gave you a, a, a tin can or a canteen type thing where you, every, the Germans lived on a soup kitchen. Uh, they made these large, big pots of soup, and as you walked through, they would give you a ladle of soup. And we held that to us all the time we were traveling. Every so often, the box, you would go out, and there'd be a soup kitchen, and you had your meal. <clears throat> and not to get too personal, but if there were no amenities, what did you gentlemen do in order to relieve yourselves? <laughs> well, there was a section of the box car that was kind of roped off with straw, and you would relieve yourself in that straw. So there was no privacy at all? No privacy, no. <laughs> yeah. Once you reached Frankfurt, then what happened? You got off the box car? Well, we went to an interrogation point. And how long did that last? That only lasted for me about, I would say, five days. You say only five days. That's sort of breathtaking <clears throat> to a novice. Well, uh, when I say five days, according to the Geneva Convention, and I don't want to, I'm not quoting, I don't know it well enough, they can interrogate you for 30 days. And uh, when my five days, <clears throat> I don't think I had, I, all I told them was my name, rank, and serial number. That's the only 
information that I was obliged to give them at that particular point, and I, I mean, for any point. And uh, I, uh, I tried to hold to that. I didn't let my guard down one bit. But I didn't have too much information that I could give them. Now, when you were interrogated, where did they keep you? Where were In you? In a cell. By yourself? By myself. The cell was very small. It was about a nine by eight, and it just had a straw mattress, and it had a bucket for personal reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, so uh, each day that bucket had to be emptied. Now, did they give you clean clothes, or were you still in the clothes that you had um, well, the, parachuted the, the, with? I checked on that because I wasn't sure to how to answer that in the sense that when I was shot down, I had a very, the, the Army uh, allotted a, a flight suit, and a flight suit was a pretty good piece of garment. And uh, someplace along the line, I lost that flight suit and got and received an old uh, oversized overcoat with pants and shirt. And I checked on that just recently, and uh, I was told that the Germans took these flight suits, sent them to a factory, were reconditioned, they took off the star, and, and they put on the swastika. So and they, they recycled. they used it themselves. Do you remember any um, severity on the part of the interrogators when they were talking with you? Uh, no, as, as far as... Uh, they, they, they didn't threaten me at all, you know, they, they more or less just said, oh, we, look, you, you, we don't have to have, we know what, more than what you're telling us. And, you, you know, and they probably did, because I didn't know that much, because I was a fill-in, and I didn't go to the briefing, and uh, I was just doing the job as a bombardier that day. And you, did you tell them that? that no. You, no. Oh, okay. no, I just right. gave them name, rank, yeah. and serial number. Yeah. And this went on, was it a scheduled interrogation or did they wake you in the middle of the night? How, how well, did it happen? I didn't happen? know that because I didn't, know, I didn't, I lost time and track because everything was more or less in darkness. This is, you know, the, this of, the, of my completely months in, in uh, incarceration, those four days, I kind of just blocked them out now. Mm -hmm. So you, do you remember being fearful or concerned for your safety at that time? I, I don't think so because we were always told that there's such a thing as retaliation and the Germans would treat you according to the Geneva Convention because they wanted their uh, captured soldiers treated the same way. So I, I, I kind of... Uh, it, it, I was I was probably fearful, but I don't think I was scared and, and, and intimidated by it. Did you ever hear from others that maybe were of higher rank than you that during their interrogation they may have had a more difficult time? Yes. yes. Do you, can you share any no, of that? No, I, I only read about it. All right, yeah. And I, but I can't... Uh, I can't, I mean, I don't, I know that several people were there a lot longer. Talking to the people in my final destination, they would tell you that they were there longer than I was. Mm -hmm. After the five days, then what happened? I was sent to Stalag Luft 1. And Stalag Luft 1 is in? Bas, Germany, and it's, there were two compounds a south compound and a north, and I was in the south compound. And had you heard anything about this camp in the past, or was this all new to you? <clears throat> From what I learned when I was there, that this camp was built to house German soldiers that were 
attended a flak school adjacent to the Stalag Lefon. There was a flak school, and when they were housed and billeted, I guess you wanted to call it, but housed in the uh, camp that we were in, and there was no new wood. All of the wood was well seasoned, so uh, it had to be used for a facility. Different, I mean, it wasn't built just for us. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your initial days at the Stalag? Uh, Talk, go well, through the very a day. first day that you, you walk through there, you were told to take your clothes off, and so you were stripped. And they put your clothes in a basket. And then you went into a shower room, and the shower room had pipes with holes in them. They turned on the water, and uh, you were uh, soaped up, and then you rinsed off. They blew a whistle, and then you waited for your clothes to come out of a delosa. This was to take care of body lice. And uh, I didn't have any. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, and then I regained my clothes, and then I was assigned to a certain barracks. And when you got to the barracks, were you in amongst friends? They were strangers, Americans, all uh, Americans. No, I, I, <clears throat> I won't say fortunately. I fortunately, by the way, that I the inexperience. I was assigned to a room that just uh, was housed people from the uh, Empire, British Empire. So I was with people from Australia and New Zealand, Canada, Northern Ireland. And then when I walked in, I was the only Yank there at the time. <laughs> were they all um Commissioned officers also. They were all commissioned officers. And and did they segregate in the camp so that commissioned officers would be in one area and, and sergeants like there were no there were no enlisted men at this camp. No enlisted men no at all. No enlisted men. They had their own camp. Mm -hmm. Did you know that, or did you find that out after the fact? Well, I never thought I'd be in a prison camp, so I just had to take everything as it came along. And when you talk about going into the showers, I think anyone watching this would instantly think about others who were in other types of camps going into showers and never coming out. Did you, you know... Mean like the German... Like the concentration camps. Did no. you know anything about those? No, not a okay. thing. I don't think... I think that... They were exposed after almost at the only one month before the war ended. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but from what I've been reading in over the years. So you're assigned to this room. How large was the room, and how many were you? I think there were it? probably oh ten in the room, and that only lasted about three months. And I was moved into a, a new barracks where there were just Americans. Just U.S. So you were with British, Australians, and Canadians, you had mentioned, right. and Irish. Um, Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, never got involved. And then, so prior to being moved, what was your day like when you were in this room? How large was the room, the first room you were oh, in? Oh, I don't think, I, it's, uh, in that, uh, it was a good size, you know, size room where they had eight bunks and, you know, bottom and top, bottom and top, bottom and top. And, you know, you, you could jump down and there was a, then there, there was an area for cooking. And then... Did uh, it have heat? No. Only the stove. Stove yes, for cooking? The stove for and cooking that... and heating. But that's, but as time went on, you didn't, they were out of coal and... You know, but, but. Did um, did they feed you well? Well, we did our own cooking. Uh, they Germans provided uh, barley and cabbage and rutabaga, butchers a turnip, uh, 
you, you knew that, General <laughs> And uh, uh, rutabaga, uh, potatoes, I didn't mention that. And uh, then we had the parcels that came through the Red Cross. So the Red Cross helped support those who were incarcerated. That's right. What was in a parcel? Uh, what was in a parcel? Well, I'm going to refer to a piece of paper. Sure. Although I guess you have it. Uh, in the parcel, there was either a can of Spam or a, or a can of corned beef. And there was powdered milk and seedless raisins, cane sugar, uh, some oleomargarine, liver pate, some coffee, a bar of chocolate, a block of, small block of cheese, and uh, cigarettes. And a lot of you smoked back then, didn't you? I didn't. But others did? But the cigarettes were very important. In what way? And they became the barter, they became the exchange if you wanted to get something on the black market. Through the Germans through or the through Germans. other soldiers? Like if you wanted a swebel, which is an onion, and you wanted an onion, you'd have to pay five, five cigarettes for an onion. And, and there was a, you know, and, and the German guards always had a pocket full of uh, that type of thing to get a... Uh, uh, <laughs> Do you remember what kind of cigarettes? I mean, what strikes I, us is Lucky time, Strike. I, I don't but, know. I no? think Chesterfield or Chesterfield. Lucky Strike. Mm -hmm. They were the two popular ones. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, a small bar of soap or a bar of soap. So you were with... An international group, really. Did, was it was it interesting for you, or was it difficult getting along with these individuals? As you said, you were the only Yank in the no, room, or did you no, all work together? Them. And what was your day like? Well, the day was uh, roll call at the very beginning of the day. And what time would that be? That would be, I'm not sure, 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And they roll called you twice a day. And uh, then they, uh, by, they did it by barracks. And part of the, uh, I don't want to jump around too much here, but uh, part of the job that you had as a POW was to keep the Germans occupied, and so they would have to have more people to take care of things. So. During these roll calls, we played games with the Germans. We tried to hide a person in the lofters, or we would try, as they were counting, is to have a guy go from one barracks to another if he could do it in a hurry. And if he got caught, he had to go into what they called the cooler. Which was? Which solitary confinement. And you would do this to keep them occupied there versus? There at that time. They would have to recall. They'd have to count over and over again. And sometimes if we could hit hide a guy, they would, the, the roll call could last a couple of hours. And while that was happening, would you have to stand still? And you want to stand still, but you'd have to stand, stand. In, the, in the group and you couldn't go one barrack by barrack. And this didn't happen daily. It happened every so often. And it was orchestrated by the commandant. And uh, just to, I just hope I'm on track, but the, the prison, the incarceration, the head commandant is always the highest ranking officer. Who is a prisoner of war. Who was a prisoner of war. For instance, when I was first incarcerated, there was a wing commander. He was British. And then all of us, one day, uh, wing commander, I think probably was like lieutenant colonel, and then an American colonel would be come in, and he would take over. 
And then if another colonel came in but was in grade longer than the other colonel, he would be. But they worked as a team. They did. They didn't. Uh, when they commanded, there wasn't any uh, military decorum. and it was, it was just the person that... Uh, the, the, they at one every, every week, about one day a week, the commandant of the American and British would meet with the commandant of the Germans at their the outside of the prison, and they would discuss issues like food and clothing and what they could eat and what they're going to you know what the situation was. And, so the commandant for the prisoners might complain that there wasn't enough food or needed more clothing, right. things like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Or just, just the mechanics of, of running an of organization. So he, the commandant was in charge. What would you be doing during the day? Well, I think I explained uh, the last time, although maybe we didn't go into it, I actually got involved a little bit with the theater uh, where uh, we had a building that was, uh, it, it was either, at, for this flag school, it was either a center for people to, for recreation for the German soldiers. So when we took it over, we had this fairly decent building. On one side of it was a, a little bit of an auditorium. Uh, it couldn't fit the whole, uh, numbers of people, but it did very well. And then on the other side was a chapel, or a place that we made a chapel, uh, where uh, mass or the, uh, the Protestants' uh, service, no, services were held by, the, in the, their case, they did not have a chaplain, but we had a chaplain. Was the chaplain a volunteer, or was he someone who was also a prisoner of war? The chaplain, they were they, you, you could, prisoner of war. Mm -hmm. uh, the first chaplain, a Catholic chaplain, do you want me to get into this now? Sure. Sure. The first Catholic chaplain was a uh, civilian in Turinay. Uh He was a kind of a, very bitter about it because he tried to get his, the authorities in England to bring him back uh, when the cloud wars were when the cloud wars were over Europe, and uh, and you call them cloud wars. Well, I'm calling them the I'm calling them when the people were talking about and they you know with the uh, the fact that they knew that something was going to happen. Everybody was tense, and everybody knew that war was inevitable, and they thought at that time the Maginot Line would keep the Germans at bay. But the Germans in one month or so went right through it like paper, water through paper. And uh, he was captured while taken a, uh, in Brussels where he was going to a school or taking some sort of a learning type of thing. And he, was, he wanted to get out because he was afraid that the, uh, and just using that, metaphor of the cloud, but he was sure he was afraid of what was going on. Now, was he taking classes to be a minister? No, no, no. he was a priest. He was just taking, you know, like they send somebody to, like I probably was going to the, the class, and he was just assigned to Brussels for a period of time. He well, wasn't a priest, or he was? Yes, he was I'm a priest. I'm sorry, he was a priest. He okay. was a priest, a Holy Ghost Father. So he, and was, he a was repatriated because he had a duodenal ulcer. And, another, and then we were about a month or so without a priest, and then all of a sudden a great guy walked in. A what? I'm sorry? I say uh, uh, another priest okay. walked in, and he was a soldier. Okay. Yeah. He was so when British. you say the first one was repatriated, they actually took him out of the prison camp and sent him home? They took him because there's an because exchange that right. takes place during a war. All right. yep. uh, sometimes civilian, employ, uh, civilian people that were caught in embassies and, and companies that were working and they, they 
they're what they call repatriated or there's an, an exchange. So then you had a new one come in who was actually in the service. He was in the service. He was, he was a was chaplain. British, and he was with uh, North Africa and he was actually a, uh, he, he was a, a, a pretty good guy. He was a tough guy. He was a major in the army. No, a captain, I'm sorry. Captain in the British Army. And you had mentioned you got into theater. Talk a little bit about that. Well, uh, things just sometimes develop. And at that time in the 30s and early 40s, they would have these, in, in the local areas in your community, they would have these amateur shows and where people would get up and sing and then bring home a, something at the Beverly end. Um, I'm old, I remember that. <laughs> Did you used to get up and sing? <laughs> no, I did not. But Irish tenors would and, you know, the local people. And um, so I, it was just a development. And uh, we had, uh, so we went into plays a little bit. And from plays, there was, we, there was uh, instruments, so we had an orchestra. Now, did you get the plays from home? Did people send them to you, or no. did you get them from the Germans? From the Germans, or from the fact that we had, you know, the English part of them. And the instruments were borrowed from the Germans, no, too? No, the, the Red Cross, I hate to be all over the, the, the place on right. this, but the Red Cross would come around about once every three or four months and they would come from neutral countries like Switzerland and Turkey and uh, maybe south of Ireland, that south of Ireland never went in, and some of the other countries that I'm not sure of were not involved, because most countries were at that time. And the Red Cross would uh, make sure that you would try to provide some athletic equipment, like baseballs and bats and gloves, but not that many. And they provide a violin and a piano and a bugle and a and trumpet, and they were, you know, it was just one of, one of one each. But there was always enough to get enough to get a band together, and, uh, and at that time, uh, the D Jimmy Dorsey type of music was being played, and Glenn Miller. And, and uh, we would put on shows and that type of thing. And, and would they be shows not only for the prisoners, but also for the Germans? Well, once in a great while, if we were putting on a big production, the Saturday night the German commandant walked in with his wife. <laughs> would he get up and say a few words? <laughs> no, or No, no, just no. sit and watch? He'd just get in and sit there. And the, they're always in the front seat. <laughs> Had the best seat in the house. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, um, you know, it wasn't, it was, it was between the German guards and you know, there was no, there was antagonism, but uh, it wasn't like the SS troops were, were guarding you. Right. It was just more or less like any of our, we hope that when, like in our own army, when we're guarding people of, of different persuasion, different, but they the, they're there because they're there because they're there, you know. And, and in fact, you gave me some paperwork, and why don't you talk a little bit about Hans Scharf, S-C-H-A-R-F-F? I, I I'm not familiar with that job. Oh, you're not, okay. No, he was the interrogator. Was he at your camp? No, that's when we go back. Uh, he was this before I got, re got, got to the camp. That was during the During time that, that five I days of five interrogation? Days. Mm -hmm. Did he, he interrogate you? I don't know who interrogated okay. me. Right. You were on a light like this, and you couldn't even see the Germans that were sitting at a table. Because the light was so bright. Yeah, they kept the light right. on you. But this comment does mention that he did treat prisoners kindly. So some of them did? For the most part, uh, I would say yes. Uh, they had 
trained dogs that as soon as they locked up your billet at night, your barracks, these dogs would be let loose in that compound. And if you were trying to get away, if you were trying to do any kind of uh, escaping or anything like that, they'd rip you apart. And did that happen? No. No, not that I was familiar with. They, we did try escape. Uh, people tried to escape on different ways, and uh, but that was a science which had to be approved by the, com the American or British uh, commander. You just didn't do it on your own. Right. And uh, the number one requisite, of course, is being able to speak the German language. <laughs> If you if you did get out, if you did get sure. out. Now, once you moved from the the room with the British and Australians, Canadians and Irish, and you went into another with the Americans barracks with the Americans, was it again about ten people in your room? Or, that. And did you know any of them? No, I, no, I don't think so. I well, I got to know some of them. And there, that's where boredom set in and the Civil War was fought every day. Inside? Inside. Talk yes. about that a little bit. Well, there was a... Uh, there would be, always be one or two persons that would say, you know, if you were the segregation and you're in nigger lover, or you want to, you know, it, and I, I, I don't like to think today because the South has changed so rapidly and to the good. But at that time, uh, there was lynchings going on in the South, and there was a, a lot of uh, antagonism. And you know, before the, the army was segregated, and uh, there were some situations that were not good. So would they take it out? Would would there be almost a separation between Northerners and Southerners? No, no. But no, no. just from conversation, Patient. would they sort of get an idea that one might have been more geared to segregation versus not, and that's where they because would say Because we were these... bored and didn't have anything sure. else to do. So you didn't have a daily chore of any kind? No. no. You and had to make your own. And in, in part one of our interview, you mentioned that one of your jobs was to initiate conversation with some of the guards and that some of the guards actually gave pieces of equipment to your group to put together a radio. radio. Right. Talk a little bit about that. Well, that was done mostly by South Africans, the South Africans who... I was very close to South Africans all during my captivity, even though I wasn't in the barracks. Now, why was that? You just because they were in the they. I don't know. Just just because I liked them and they liked you know we we got to be compatible. That's mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't because they're South Africans or because I was, but the, and the radio was actually hidden in the, the between the theater and the chapel. And uh, we, it was in the raft, is like oh, you'd pull up between the two by fours, and uh, when they were working the radio after they got it going, uh, because I was around that building quite a bit, uh, when German guards came on the scene suddenly, I was, you know, I was supposed to kind of keep them at bay and talk to them and and that type of thing. Now when you were, you didn't do the musicals, but did you help produce them? Or were you the stagehand? What did you do with some of the theater? Did you, were you part of the, the acting group or the singing group? No, thank you. <laughs> but you were involved. I was involved. Yeah. I made, maybe made the, uh, helped to make the, uh, Scenery and the props and, and things the props like that. and okay. uh, and the you know the, it was good with the people that I'm working with. They we didn't have women, and a lot of the times guys had to dress up with as women, mm -hmm. and they did a good job. 
at some of the plays that we had. So that would keep you busy, especially if you had, as you said, some monotonous days because of nothing to do. So I, that's right. I think I try to keep busy 95% of the time. I took my walks around the perimeter of the uh, camp with people that I was quite friendly with, and I developed certain close friends, as you would. So this is January, February. This is a whole, whole year plus. Of 1944. And 45? Part and of 45? And 45, yes, and 45. But in 45, like, we went back going, I don't want to go back, but going back to the Red Cross parcels, they became almost completely eliminated. As, as you were later into the camp? As, a, as, big, as the war went on, the infrastructure of Germany was destroyed to such an extent that... Uh, so you weren't getting as many supplies? We were not getting food, no. Did you lose weight? Yes. How much did you lose? Oh, I went from about 160 when I joined the service and came out of the prison camp about 140. So what did you eat? Did you get the barley and the... The barley and the rutabagas. rutabagas. And the barley had worms. But the worms was protein. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and we thought and kidded about it, but there was no... Nobody ever got sick that I know of mm -hmm. that ate worms. But we boiled them. We weren't eating alive. <laughs> now, earlier you mentioned that it was obviously the commandant and the group that made the decisions about what would be done. And you mentioned that it was through them or through the commandant that someone or others would or would not try to escape. Do you remember any particular incident where they tried to escape? Yes, but I was not privy to too much of it. Because in working in the theater, uh, one time we were trying to make a uh, clothes that people would be able to use if they could get out into the uh, beyond the barbed wire and we had you have so many people you can get people that are pretty good in sewing mm -hmm. and people that are good at making tin things and out of the cans and that type of thing and there was a we did at one time work on trying to get clothes where if a person could get out, they would be in a civilian clothes and, you know. But that, that's about as far as it went. Other than that, I didn't know any of the plans, no. But do you remember some escaping su no, successfully? No, no one ever escaped. Okay. Yeah. Do you, you remember, did you, you did get mail from home. And when you mentioned that at the end, with everything collapsing, you didn't get Red Cross packages, did that also mean that you didn't get as much mail from home? Yep. The mail from home was all during the uh, incarceration was a problem. Uh, they would have a mail call that mail came in and uh, you could get three letters and the person next to you wouldn't get any. And then you could go a couple of times where mail was distributed and you didn't get any. And a lot of times was when you received a letter, it, it made reference to something happened at home on another letter that they assume you knew the information and they were building on it and you didn't know what they were talking about. So obviously someone was f looking at the mail? I or? think the mail just didn't get through on the basis of bombings or uh, waylaid or... Did it anyone... It was just infrastructure problems, I think. Were the letters open before you received them? They could have been, but I don't remember. I think they were, I think they were opened. I don't know whether it was the American side or the 
I, I, I'm not as positive about right. that as I should be. I don't so you know. don't remember if any letters had any blacked out information? I think they did. Mm -hmm. I think they did. Mm -hmm. I think the Germans uh, looked at the mail before they went out. How did your family find out that you were a prisoner of war? It came through uh, some facility in either the Red Cross or the Germans announced, uh, and sometimes there was this person that was kind of the uh, antagonist that talked um, to the troops, you know, and they said and they might say, so so and so from. Providence, Rhode Island is now a prisoner or something like that. But anyway, my family finally, two ways, someone did hear it on shortwave radio and sent a letter or called my father. But then uh, they would get the official government paper. And was it a letter or a telegram? Do you know that? I think the letter the State Department or something like that. There was, I'm sure they had it uh, plagiarized to work. I mean, they made them out in bolts because it wasn't unusual. Your original crew on your plane, you were pretty close with, um, and you were obviously separated that evening. Right. Did you ever see them again? No, but I received Christmas cards. And, and we, were they, did they, I think you mentioned th they yeah, were they, short, shot they down were, too. I think they were shot down too. They were shot down eventually. But they weren't in the same stylog as you. No, not in the same stylog. If they were, they were in the north compound. Do you remember anything really humorous or thoughtful about your stay as a prisoner of war? Well, I remember we were so bored one night, we got worms out of the Bali thing, and we had a worm race. <laughs> <laughs> we set up, and then we each got our own worm. And uh, is that humorous? I don't I think it's crazy, but <laughs> we, got, we, we had a worm race. And then uh, I'd like to go back to and explain the situation, though, that happened with Father Charlton. Now, Father Charlton was the Catholic. officer? The Catholic priest that was from the officer, yes. Yes, and he was in the service. He was he your was second in the chaplain. Service. He okay. was the captain in the British Army. And his name again? Father Charlton. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a picture of him. But the situation, he was, he was one day he was going to beat up the whole camp, <laughs> and he almost. Why? Uh, what happened? Well. You have to understand the, you know the the lousa that we had. Yes. All of a sudden, the rumor got it. They got around that there were forty women with no clothes on, nude. Over, and the lousa was about thirty yards from the barbed wire. And what was it like? A shower that you would have to go yes. under? Yes. Okay. I, I explained that you mm -hmm. put your clothes in a basket mm -hmm. and then you take a shower. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the, they were people coming that were taken by the Germans, and they call them DPs, the place persons, and they take them out of a town or something in Lithuania or uh, some part of Russia, and the. Um, and they, they women they were probably from teenagers to uh, in their forties, and they had and they were stripped, nothing. They, you had no towels, no you know, and your clothes were in this basket. So Father Charlton comes upon two thousand uh, <laughs> Kriegies, No, the, I mean a good percentage of the camp. Wow, and some of the. American soldiers were doing the cat whistle stuff, and they were, you know, we, and you, know, you know, and all that. And the women had just come from that shower. Their hair was over their faces. They were just pathetic looking. And of course, he tried to break it up. And he was getting flack from the uh, flack using that word again, 
but he was getting flack from some people. Listen, papists, you can't tell me to move. You're not my shepherd. I'm not one of your sheep. And there was, so all of a sudden there was a, it looked like there was gonna be a real free for all. And uh, somebody with sense, common sense, went to the commander, the our commander, and he come running down the street and, you know, screaming, and he says he threatens your court martial if any this area isn't cleared. In five minutes, you'll be up subject to court martial, and we will throw the book at you, you know. And of course, everybody moved out, and which was good, mm -hmm. and it defused the situation. But that happened three times while we were there. Uh, these women went through that, but the, uh, they had no trouble. After that, there was nobody. Well, I think guys walked and kind of looked. <laughs> I kept walking. But they kept walking. Now, once the women were there, were they prisoners also in that camp? Well, uh, no, no. They, it was a delousing unit. So they would get they deloused. Used, and, then and then they, unfortunately, they had to go to a workplace or something, like a work and, and work in a mill or put in arms way working in a factory. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a, a um, Channel 2 had a uh, documentary one time that it took some of these people years to try to get home uh, back to where they came from because they were not only caught, but they, if they were caught on one side of the line, then the, the Russians built up the other side, then you had that German wall type of thing where you could, East Germany and regular Germany, and it was a real sad situation. But Charlton, he, <laughs> he was tough. And, and well, he should have been. I hmm? mean, somebody had to take oh. the, yeah. Tell me, when you mentioned that 16, 18 months that you were a prisoner of war, and you said there was a lot of boredom, did you ever feel a real sense of despair? No. Why? No. Huh? Why do you think that? Why do you think you did well, so because, well? Well, uh, because I think the reason you didn't feel that way is because of the two-way radio, the radio you had. You could pick up from the BBC the fact that the invasion was happening, and then uh, you could even if you had a map of Europe, you didn't want the Germans to see it, but you could plot the towns that were falling when they're crossing the Ebb River and, and, the, and Mussolini dying and Hitler. When we were in the prison camp, uh, Hitler's life was threatened at that particular time that he opened up his briefcase and there was an explosion. Do you, I don't know whether you remember that through history or and not. And so you heard all this. Right. Did did, that, didn't, that helped the despair problem. That it was almost over. Yeah. And then once you got out of the camp, or, or tell us about the days leading up to your end of confinement. Did, could you tell it was coming soon, or you didn't realize how quickly? Well, one, we, we were in the prison camp, of course, and incarcerated, and when we knew that, of course, that, you know, Berlin, I think Berlin fell before we were actually relieved, but that was only a day or so. And one morning, you know, so we, we had a pretty good idea, and uh, for all the last month or two, that any time a German soldier were marching down the street, all the people, the American soldiers would be saying, Rusky coming, Rusky coming, and that was, that, they had every reason to fear that, the German soldiers. And uh, soon, just soon, all of a sudden one day, there was no guards in the tower. And the American commander, he had a car ready for him with the American and British flag and a Red Cross flag on top of it. And he, they were going out to meet the Russians with the, uh, and they did, and they brought a, they brought a field marshal of a Russian with pretty high rank back to the camp. And uh, it was a, uh, 
you know, he, he was snapping orders. And then, unfortunately, Mongolians came in. Now, whether this was a tactic used by the Russians or not, and the herds of Mongolians just raped the whole area, raped it. And uh, one young woman was brought, German woman was brought into the camp for medical reasons because she had been raped so much. And um, the guys that went out, we were told to stay put. And some, you know, when some of the guys wouldn't stay put, as soon as the, they, the fence was open, they went into the town of Bath. And these Mongolians were in there and they ripped the watches off their hands and, <laughs> and tried to get their wedding rings off if they were married. So that was, uh, and then all of a sudden, everything calmed right down, and German, Russian soldiers moved in and set up checkpoints, and, uh, and they actually brought in a USO, I mean, not a US, a, a, a camp group. And they actually, one at night, put on a show for us with the dancing and the, and the music, and they had a regular, it was handled, they set up their own platform, their own staging, and... Uh, so was this a Russian group? A Russian group, So it was yes. almost like the Russian USO. Yeah, it's a Russian USO. Yeah. What were you all feeling then? Were you, was there excitement, or...? Well, the excitement is one, how are we going to get out of here? When are we going to go home? Mm -hmm. When are we going to go home? Mm -hmm. And I should have, and I meant to at that particular time. There was one other incident that we're talking about, is that the time that the Germans had all the Jewish kids uh, lined up and took them to another building from both the south and the north compound. And we were fearful of that. But we still wasn't, we didn't have the knowledge about the concentration camps. Now, when you mentioned Jewish kids. Jewish soldiers. So they. Our, 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 our bodies. So you had dog tags that said what your religion was? or I think on the dog, town, dog tag it had PC or the, the House of David. Somehow they knew. They knew. And they took them? and took them and, se and separated them from the regular groups. Did they go out of the camp or did they stay? Uh, they went to, I don't know where, I think they went out to a special building that they made for them. And, uh, and the, I had a couple of very close Jewish friends, not, you know, Jewish acquaintances, and they weren't quite friendly even the fact that, like a kid from Brooklyn that I used to walk with and, and uh, I, I was afraid for him. I Did they make the it kid. out, or do well, you? Well, they made it out, but there were, according to the rumors, that Hitler had ordered all Jewish POWs to be executed. No, they didn't do it. They got out. There was no problem with that at the end. Do you feel that the soldiers who were? Um the German soldiers who were overseeing your Stalag were good and helpful and friendly to you, and they they were. There was a couple of incidences where there was something done that was uncalled for, and uh, one person lost their life. Do you want to talk about that? Well, during a bombing raid in Germany, they had the you know the the. the sirens go off and one person didn't get back into the barracks and he didn't hear the siren he was doing something else because the si that was almost a daily thing and you had to go back into your barracks and uh, put down the windows and and uh, you couldn't just you know look out and so one person from a gun turret saw this POW outside of his you know, and, and shot him. And there was no need for that. I mean, it was, the guy was lost. And, but then for the most part, to answer your question, uh, they were human beings just like us. And there were a lot of German soldiers that were part of this, from the sound of music, 
you know, the Austrian. They were Austrians that were just automatically uh, part of the German army. And that went on for Czechs too and some of the other. Whether they liked it or not, they Whether had they to be. Whether they liked it or not, mm -hmm. they were of soldier's age and they were in a captive country. And it's no different than say to, uh, that we ask Puerto Ricans to fight for, the, for us even though they're not a state. And uh, so on that level, there were a lot of Germans, I mean a lot of German soldiers that hated the, the, the situation they were in. Mm -hmm. And I've talked. I talked with them, and, and and there was not very few SS mentality type of German soldiers. I've never met them. Mm -hmm. Did you have any after effects from your confinement? Any kind of post trauma? They call it post traumatic stress or anything like that after your confinement. <laughs> Unfortunately, no, unless it's still shown. <laughs> no, I never did. Well, I can't thank you enough, Bill O'Brien, William okay. F. O'Brien. This has been a remarkable uh, information that you've shared with us, both in part one and in part two. Thank you so much for okay, continuing with us. Okay, thank you very much, and thank the library, and thank you, Mr. McDermott. Thanks.